A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited to welcome you to the 170th Bar Association of Sri Lanka webinar organized by the BAS Seminars Committee on the topic, Expanding Frontiers of Administrative Law. This is the 71st webinar of the English webinar series and the final one for this term organized by the Seminars Committee of the BAS, hosted by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and conducted on the Zoom platform. And for those of you who are unable to register on Zoom, hopefully you're joining us on our YouTube live stream on the BASL YouTube channel, where you can find every webinar organized by the BASL Seminars Committee thus far, like this one, at your convenience. Before we start, I would like to thank the Seminars Committee of the BASL, the Chairman of the Seminars Committee and the Secretary of the BASL, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuriya. Convener of the Seminars Committee and Assistant Secretary of the BASL, Mr. Pasandu Silva, and the co-conveners, Mr. Pandulavan Niarachi, Mr. Ushan, uh, Mr. Ushan Ubeyaratna, Ms. Anne Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Mahapitigama, who, despite the various power disruptions and difficulties, persisted with organizing these informative and valuable webinars for the benefit of the BASL membership, as well as the general public, for which we are Great, grateful indeed. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Peeris, President's Council, and the other members of the Management Committee of the Bar Association for all their support and guidance. As I've already mentioned, today's topic is on expanding frontiers of administrative law, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the esteemed panel and moderator for this evening. First, let me introduce His Lordship. Justice A.H.M.D. Nawaz. Justice Nawaz was sworn in as a judge of the Supreme Court on the 1st of December, 2020. Prior to his assumption of office as, a, as the president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Nawaz had been functioning as a senior justice of the court and dealt with several provinces of law, such as civil and criminal appeals, as well as judicial review. Before Justice Nawaz was elevated to the judiciary, as a judge of the Court of Appeal in 2014, he had been long serving in the Attentions Department as a state counsel, a senior state counsel, and deputy solicitor general. In the year 2005, Justice Nawaz won the prestigious British Shivering Scholarship awarded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and pursued his Masters of Law in Commercial and Corporate Law at King's College, London. In the year 2008, he won the Fulbright Humphrey Fellowship awarded by the US government and pursued his second LLM in transnational criminal and commercial law at Washington College of Law, American University. Whilst on the Fulbright Humphrey Fellowship, Justice Navas worked as a foreign attorney at global law firms such as Arnold and Porter and Squire and Saunders and Dempsey. Justice Nawaz also secured a third Master's of Law in Constitutional Law and Administrative Law from the Faculty of Law of the University of Colombo. Justice Nawaz, while serving in the Attentions Department, extensively appeared for both domestic and international arbitrations and later lectured in arbitration both to domestic and overseas students. He also holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Colombo. Next, let me introduce Dr. Sunil Kure. Dr. Sunil Kure was educated at Holy Cross College, Kalutara, St. Joseph's College, Colombo, St. Joseph's Junior Aid, Kohuala, as okay. well as St. Peter's College, Colombo. In 1966, he entered the law faculty of the University of Ceylon and graduated in 1969. At the Ceylon Law College, Advocate's final examination held in May 1971, he was awarded a first class, and in January 1972, he was admitted and enrolled as an advocate of the Supreme Court of Ceylon. Since 1972, he has been continuously in active practice, mainly in civil litigation, in original courts, as well as different tribunals, and also in appellate courts. From 1969, he functioned as a lecturer in law until 1987 and also served as an examiner at different times and in different subjects 
at the first intermediate and final examination held by law college for the admission of attorneys at law. He also lectured on administrative law at the University of Colombo during two academic years as a visiting lecturer. Finally, let me introduce Mr. Manohar Jayasinghe. So Jayasinghe is a state counsel of the Attorney General's Department and has previously worked in the chambers of, of late Mr. D.S. Vijay Singh, a President's Counsel. He was a Bachelor of Civil Law from the University of Oxford, a Master of Law from the University of Cambridge, as well as an Executive Program in Trade Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has served as a judge advocate of the Sri Lanka Air Force and is also a certified adjudicator of the Asian Arbitration Center. He has also been nominated by the Honorable Latin General to assist the Financial Investigation Unit of the Central Bank as well as the Presidential Commission on Customs Malpractices. The moderator for this evening is Mrs. Lakmini Varsavitana. Mrs. Varsavitana was also called to the bar in the year 2009 and has over the years gained extensive and varied experience as well as exposure in all aspects of appellate work, having joined the chambers of Mr. Sanjeeva Jayavadana President's Council. She holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the Open University of Sri Lanka and a postgraduate diploma on international trade law from the University of Wales. With that, let me remind members joining this session by Zoom to send in their questions through the Q&A chat box to reach the moderator. I will now hand over the proceedings to the moderator. Over to you, Mrs. Vaswitana. Thank, thank you, Tanvijay. A warm welcome to all of you, as well as our distinguished panelists. As you all are aware, our topic today for this webinar is expanding the frontiers of administrative law. Administrative law is that branch of law which deals with as to how and in what manner public authorities are required to exercise their powers, functions, and duties. In effect, administrative law is that one important branch of law which regulates governmental and executive power. I suppose it is in that light originally courts were courts adopted a fairly restrictive approach towards writs. But after the time, courts adopted a fairly progressive approach. And it is in that light, courts tended to throw away various shackles with regard to looking at the source of power, the nature of power, as well as error outside the jurisdiction or whether outside the jurisdiction or whether it was inside the jurisdiction. Our panelists here today will, us, will educate us more with regard to these concepts. And in this light, I invite His Lordship Justice Nawaz to open these proceedings up. Thank you. I believe His Lordship. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go on, sir. We can hear All right. you. All right, you can hear me. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me share this uh, slide. Right. I hope that. Uh, hey, uh, do you see this? Do you this you, you see the slide, uh, Lakmini? Uh, not really, sir. Can you see this? Can you see the slide? I'm sharing it. Yeah, give me a moment. Do you see now? Uh, it says start screen sharing. Yes, yes, sir. We can see your desktop right now, but not the document per se. Do you see it now? You see it now? You can see it now, sir. Right. Okay, right. So now, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm just, you know, just to uh, give you a little bit of uh, um, um, introduction to what I would say today, right? Uh, I will uh, uh, just look at uh, a few developments in judicial review. Uh, and uh, so now, what do I uh, look at today? Uh, let, let me look at what is called the substantive review, right? Uh, now, uh, substantive review uh, is, is, is review where the courts, 
evaluate the reasoning behind the executive's exercise of discretion. In other words, uh, when you bring a decision before court uh, to challenge it on the basis that uh, it falls foul of the grounds, the recognized grounds uh, on which Sheshwarara uh, or mandamus can issue, you can indulge in what is called a substantive review. In other words, the, both the um, uh, courts and the, um, and, the, and, the, and the lawyers and the attorneys uh, who um, support the applications for review can uh, argue that this is a matter that is subject to uh, what would uh, be called substantive review. In other words, it's the, the bifurcation is already well known to many lawyers that uh, in a writ application, you look at the process, the decision-making process. You don't look at the merits of the decision. The merits of the decision is, is something that uh, usually an appellate procedure looks at, right? So now, uh, there are uh, certain grounds of review. There are certain grounds of review that we can safely say looks at the merits whether you we like it or not. We keep on citing uh, cases such as events. You, you have to read uh, the Court of Appeal judgments and the Supreme Court judgments to look at uh, these traditional notions of judicial review, which is looked upon as something that looks at the decision-making process. Now, say, for instance, uh, natural justice, you know the rules, uh, audi alteram pardon, if you don't observe natural justice, if you don't give a hearing and reach a decision, that decision is why? Because in your decision-making process, you didn't take into account um, uh, the concept of how the alteram part. I mean, other you didn't give a hearing, right? That's a process uh, review. Uh, easy to explain um, uh, the uh, the. Uh, the, the uh, traditional notion of judicial review, uh, through that you can say, we look at the process. But if you look at substantive review, you, you, don't, you don't look at uh, the process. Rather, you look at uh, the reasoning of, of, of a judge and look at the decision and say, well, it, it doesn't, uh, um, uh, it doesn't uh, look to be uh, right. In other words, that, that, that is a review where you don't question the legality, but rather you look at the decision and say the decision is so bad that it has to be cost, right? But usually in writ application, you don't look at the decision and then and, and say that it, it has to be cost. Usually you come out, uh, the, the uh, petitioner's uh, counsel will always say that the part that was taken by the decision maker is procedurally wrong, legality. There's something illegal, right? So what is that substantive review? The reason why I am doing it, why I am coming out with it is because there has been very few discussions on this in the past. If you look at the case law, uh, if you look at um, the, the Sri Lankan case law uh, prior to, um, uh, to 2000 or before then, uh, we don't see this is being discussed in detail. That, um, uh, now, the con at the conceptual level, one must understand how uh, judicial review works, and we don't, we don't see this being discussed. So could be, I was quite sensitive to, the, to this. And it was uh, in the 2014 and uh, in the year 2014 and 15, uh, I started uh, from, uh, engaging with this, from, uh, from with this, with this, because there has been sparse discussion on this, right? So, uh, so that is why I'm once again uh, repeating it, uh, just to show you the the the, the merit review, uh, even though we piously say that there is no merit review, but there is merit review uh, when we indulge in what is called Bensbury unreasonableness. So now it is being strewn all over. You will see, uh, you will see uh, judges talk about it. You will see the attorneys talk about it. You will see 
pleading stock of um, uh, the decision being very very unreasonable but the the sense in which it is understood um, the, the the two senses in which it is understood uh, in commonwealth jurisdiction has not been dealt with in our judgments i have been quite sensitive to this that is why i thought uh, i will deal with it uh, um, in this uh, brief discussion that i am uh, privileged to have before you so then it all flows from that famous case uh, that was decided uh, in the same year as we gained independence the case of associated provincial picture houses versus benchbury corporation right so then lord green's judgment now this is today the the judgment that is being talked about very brief judgment not even two pages uh, runs into just a just one page judgment if you look at it but it has produced such enormous literature uh, and uh, there are, these are the words that were used by lord green if the decision is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could have come to it so in other words he looks at the decision now now, now if you if you look at that citation uh, if you look at that um, uh, expression uh, the challenge decision is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could have come to it so in other words he doesn't look at uh, the process rather he looks at the decision itself and this has been portrayed as imposing a high threshold in uh, judicial review in other words you have to show before court you have to show before court and satisfy court that this venceberry unreasonableness has occurred in other words it's in a narrow sense now there are two senses in which uh, in which it is understood the narrow sense and the broad sense of men's very unreasonable or, or they call it the men's very unreasonableness in the umbrella sense in the narrow sense you look at the decision and uh, the decision is so uh, glaring uh, to you this it's so shocking that the decision maker made that decision and then court cautions this so the, when, then the commentators say that when the court cautions that by looking at the decision itself it's called venceberry unreasonableness in the narrow sense right so so in other words as lord helsham says two reasonable persons can reasonably come to opposite conclusions on the same set of facts without forfeiting their title to be uh, right to be reasonable and therefore therefore you don't classify every decision as venceberry unreasonable right only when the venceberry unreasonableness reaches that high standard not every decision is unreasonable only when the venceberry unreasonableness reaches that standard of the high threshold right now there was this uh, case of short versus pool corporation in other words you dismiss a teacher because her hair was red right so that kind of decision they said law according to lord green that is the kind of decision that will get disqualified on the basis of venceberry unreasonableness it's a merit based review then what about venceberry unreasonableness in the umbrella sense the the other spectrum or, or, or on your left hand side you get venceberry unreasonableness in the narrow sense on the right hand side you get venceberry unreasonableness in the umbrella sense right what is that umbrella sense lot of grounds are there uh, to attack a decision in other words if you can show mala fides if you can show dishonesty in the way a decision has been arrived at if you can show even attention given to extraneous circumstances so come all of us know when a decision maker takes into account irrelevant considerations or ignoring relevant considerations or giving little weight to relevant considerations in other words 
you, you go and disregard public policy and things like that. When you go and do that, so a lot of grounds, it's like an umbrella. It's like, like, it's like an umbrella, right? And then that's called the men's very unreasonableness in the umbrella sense, right? Or larger sense or broad sense. So it is within that broad spectrum that Wensbury unreasonableness test operates. But if you look at the argument sometimes that is put forward, if you look at the pleadings that is, that, that is um, sometimes you cannot make head or tail of, of which sense it is being referred to, uh, in which sense it is being referred to, right? So now I just wanted to place this before you because Lord Green himself in that one page judgment of Wensbury and this Wensbury Corporation, he himself talks about it. He, he doesn't say umbrella sense and, uh, and uh, narrow sense. It is the commentators who looked at this and bifurcated the test into two, right? So you can attack a decision either on the first ground of Wensbury unreasonableness in the narrow sense, or you can attack a decision on the um, on the Wensbury unreasonableness in the in the umbrella sense. So this is the uh, um, uh, spectrum that we have, and and most English cases uh, definitely deal with it. Unfortunately, we have not come to grips with this. Now look at this slide where I show. Um, Attention given to extraneous circumstances, disregard of public policy and things like that. In other words, you take into account irrelevant consideration and that itself is enough to, uh, to disqualify or cost the decision. Now, that sometimes is talked of as illegal. Uh, now, if, if you look at illegality, it's, it's not mere ultra-virus. Uh, in other words, this can merge into even the ground of illegality. So, uh, in other words, Wensbury unreasonableness will also cover, will also cover illegality um, uh, in a sense. So now these are developments that we must bring to bear uh, come in our mind. And uh, now, now let me show you how Lord Diplock, long after the case of Wensbury Corporation in 1948, described unreasonableness in a narrow sense, in a different way. Now he said, now I said it's merits-based review. You don't look at the process, you will just look at the decision, right? He said, if a decision is so outrageous in its defiance of logic of ex or accepted moral standards, that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it, famous GCHQ case or civil service union uh, service union case, then he said in that um, formulation also you can um, you can describe that decision as unreasonable, but it's also in the narrow sense. In other words, he called it irrationality. He, he called it irrationality. What was called unreasonable was called by Lord Diplock as irrationality. And so irrationality here, the word that is used by Lord Diplock is, is used to denote the narrow sense in which Wensbury unreasonableness was discussed. These are things uh, we must have these conceptual uh, gleanings or conceptual underpinnings. Uh, I, I just wanted to have this air to you so that you will be alive uh, to this development. Right? Okay. Now, as opposed to this, as opposed to this, we have today proportionality taking over administrative law. Now, this is called uh, an, a foreign intruder. Even the English judges sometimes call it an intruder that has crept into uh, the administrative uh, justice. Right? Uh, because it's an EU principle. And uh, so there you can see a structured analysis. Now, that is the difference. Now, somebody asked me recently, what is the difference between 
when it's very unreasonableness and proportionality, the difference is that there's a structured test that proportionality formulates. In other words, you, you take a decision, bring it before court, and you say that uh, there is a protected right or interest, and this protected right or interest has been infringed by the executive. There is an infringement. That's tier number one. Then you show that um, is then the question asked is is the um, the uh, um, the uh, the decision that has been reached uh, to deviate or infringe uh, is it necessary and is it a proper response to a legitimate objective? In other words, that's the respondent who who has to uh, has to satisfy that test, right? So now. The, so since this is um, a structured test, this was referred to in that famous case of Bang Mallard versus Her Majesty's Treasury, number two, 2013, right? I would advise you to, uh, to, to have a look at this decision. And uh, because of this, a lot of uh, writers argue that proportionality can deal with the Vensbury unreasonableness and can even replace Pensbury unreasonableness. Uh, in other words, when there are decisions taken for public welfare, if somebody is attacking that decision for public welfare in courts, then if you argue that because of that decision, your protected right or interest uh, has been uh, has been infringed, then it is up to the respondent to uh, show court that it was a necessary and proper response uh, to a legitimate objective. Uh, the objective uh, is sufficiently important to justify a breach in the right. So in other words, you can engage in an intrusive penetration of the judgment or of the decision taken, right? By employing this structured analysis. So now, do we replace unreasonableness with proportionality? In my view, if I may put it this way, in my view, it won't be far off when, uh, when we go and replace it with proportionality. So now sometimes, the criticism about Bensbury unreasonableness is this. It is the judges who look at something and then make their value judgments on a decision. It's, in other words, when you give them uh, the discretion uh, to look at the judgment and call it unreasonable, several judges can ascribe unreasonableness in the degrees to which they find acceptable or they find opposite. So therefore, uh, the unstructured nature in the Bensbury unreasonable in a test is flawed. And uh, if you look at the judgment in Bang Malat versus a uh, magistrate treasury number two, you can see this is being preferred uh, um, a great deal. So now I just put this ECHR's rights just to tell you when human rights violations are engaged when they result in decisions, depriving somebody of, uh, of uh, fundamental rights, then the intrusive nature is, is greater. In other words, proportionality comes in, right? Proportionality comes in. So proportionality can easily be engaged in cases of this uh, nature. Uh, and, uh, but there are certain decisions which are even uh, taken out of the test of proportionality because the response has been stated by the judges to be a necessary and proper response. Now say for instance, a decision that is being taken uh, in a polycentric matter. In, a, in other words, uh, a tax exemption or a tax imposition. Right? So now it is always your right 
to keep your money. But if taxes are imposed and, and the money is taken away from you, a protected right is taken away or protected interest is taken away, right? So now that infringement, can you attack it on the basis that uh, it is a disproportionate response uh, from that the government is uh, doing? There are cases, those cases say, right, even on proportionality, the tax exemptions or tax uh, um, impositions uh, cannot be uh, come, uh, come taken or come, cannot be uh, come, cannot be attacked uh, on the basis that it infringes your protected right because because uh, because you just uh, just take the view that uh, there can be necessary and proper responses. Uh, it can be a necessary and proper response to a legitimate objective. So these are thoughts that I wanted to come uh, come uh, just show you. Right, and then there was this case of FAM was a Secretary of State for the Home Department, 2015, UKSC 19. It really explains uh, the uh, the re recent developments in proportionality. I think you should uh, uh, um, look at uh, this case carefully. And uh, another development that it has. Uh, that that has taken place in 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 in, in the jurisdiction is the uh, is the merger of Article uh, Twelve or Article uh, Thirteen or all other fundamental rights in the RIT jurisdiction. Now, if somebody asks me as to what is RIT jurisdiction and what is fundamental jurisdiction, I always look at it in a different way, right? Uh, in other words, both constitute judicial review, right? But in writ jurisdiction, we look at statutory uh, rights and their infringement. But in the case of fundamental right jurisdiction, we look at fundamental rights and their infringement. In other words, uh, in other words, um, both constitute judicial review. That is why. Uh, some time ago, De Smith's book was called Judicial Review of uh, Executive Action or State Action. But now they have changed the title. Uh, they, they just call it Judicial Review. Uh, in other words, even uh, fundamental rights review is, is also called Judicial Review, right? So now both have been merged in the United Kingdom. In the same way, we have uh, moved towards the merger as everybody knows, right? That's because every time uh, we uh, attack a decision in a writ court, Article 12.1, the equality provision is also engaged. Now, courts have gone to the extent of saying legitimate expectation. Uh, I'll, I'll send you this uh, uh, presentation uh, to Lakmini so that she can disseminate this. The legitimate expectation is now thought of as a component, an indispensable part of Article 12.1, right? That's the merger that has taken place. Now, Indian judgments uh, have said that. Now, their equivalent of Article 12 is Article 14. Our, uh, their equivalent of our Article 12 is Article 14. So therefore, therefore, uh, merger has taken place. These are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Right at the moment, as Lakmini uh, uh, says, Lakmini, I'm in the middle of a, a conference here <laughs> in a foreign jurisdiction, and I had to virtually come away from that conference and then get into uh, this uh, um, room just to share this with you. But I'll send you this. I'm unable to go through the entire presentations the whole um, today. I can't even stay. Uh, right throughout uh, um, uh, the program, yeah, but I wish you all the best. And then I will make this uh, uh, presentation available to the bar so that uh, they can look at the developments. This is a um, uh, presentation that I uh, made the whole of last night before I implained uh, to India, but, uh, but I'm unable to show this and explain because since I have to make another address tonight, so therefore, uh, I will share this with you. But these are the thoughts that I wanted to 
uh, share with you. Um, and Lakmini can talk about the developments uh, that the, the, the RIP jurisdiction has taken um, uh, in, uh, in, in in Sri Lanka, in our country, how we have developed the RIP jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, But the conceptual underpinnings that is developing today uh, in the Commonwealth jurisdiction has to be taken note of. Uh, and we have to incorporate them in our arguments. Uh, and the substantive legitimate expectation is something uh, that has now gained ground uh, in Sri Lanka with the judgment of Justice Prasanna Jayavadana. I, I have just included a judgment called Funukane uh, in this presentation, which is the latest judgment on, on legitimate, substantive legitimate expectation. And uh, we have come to a state where uh, not only rights are protected, but even interest. Uh, now, even when an interest is violated, judicial review lies. Uh, and it's a sliding scale, right? Uh, you don't have to show that uh, you, ha you have a right. You can even show, a petitioner can even show that he has an interest in something. And that interest is protected. Judges have developed on that, right? So it's the, the Rex versus Electricity Commissioner formula that your right has to be violated for a petition to be mounted in a writ court is a misnomer now, right? All this is the new development uh, that I can share with you. So then I'll come uh, send it to you, Lakmini. Thank you very much for at least briefly coming on and uh, making this presentation. Thank you so much, all the best to you. And uh, good Thank luck you. to all the other presenters, Dr. Kure, Mr. Manori, uh, Jayasinghe, and all others who are there. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for logging in in the midst of your busy schedule while in India, in the midst of your other professional engagements. I actually had a few questions to ask you, but I suppose we are running out of time. I, I have to make a presentation now, right? I, I'm just going off, yes. right? Thank right. you. Thank you. Completely thank understand. you. Thank you very much. All the best. All the best. Thank you. So on. On that note, uh, we will now be, uh, uh, Dr. Sunil Kure will be addressing us on the further developments uh, in Sri Lanka with regard to the RIT jurisdiction. Um, I believe uh, Justice Nawaz has also delivered the judgment on the um, subject of social ratified mandamus and Dr. Kure, you were uh, the counsel for the petitioner in that matter. You can also address us on that uh, landmark judgment uh, where court in fact molded relief going outside the purview of a prayer. And there have been several judgments right now uh, in Sri Lanka, which has advocated this position. Over to you, sir. So you have to unmute your mic. Can you hear me now? Can hear you, sir. Can hear. Okay. Okay. And now, as far as uh, what you referred to is concerned, that is, certiorari fine mandamus is concerned, it's simply this: that uh, uh, if an application is made only for mandamus, and in granting mandamus, the court finds that there has been uh, invalid exercise of power, uh, then the court can although there's no prayer for it, disregard that invalid exercise of power and proceed to grant mandamus. And it's called a certiorari ratified mandamus because although there is no prayer for certiorari, right, the court will treat as if there was a prayer for certiorari, right? And you'll disregard or quash it, quash it and proceed to issue the writ of mandamus that has been applied for. It's simply that, I mean, there's no uh, complicated uh, sort of uh, uh, complicated statement to be made on that because you now uh, it's sometimes uh, the respondents argue well before before you can pray for mandamus you have to get something out of the way say a wrong decision has been made uh, without that decision being said got out of the way you can't ask for mandamus well in that case the court can disregard the certiorari, uh, sorry, the order that is uh, that is standing in your way, and it's called uh, certiorari fight mandamus. So mandamus is issued 
although it is not uh, prayed that you should set aside that earlier order which stands in the way of granting mandamus. Now, having said that, I really do not know um, uh, whether I should, uh, how, how I should proceed with the matter. But as far as uh, practical aspects, aspects are concerned, there is a wrong impression among many of us that uh, a writ can be obtained only in respect of or against statutory bodies. Statutory bodies. But that is not so. For instance, you can ask for a writ of certiorari right, to quash uh, exercise of power by a private body, such as by a bank. And that's what happens today. Uh, many people are dissatisfied with uh, revocation or rather uh, recovery of loans and uh, or maybe parati execution. And if something goes wrong in parati execution, normally the, uh, the relief sort is uh, application for certiorari to quash maybe the resolution of the bank. And that is done on the basis that it's impossible to quash any statutory exercise of power. It may be a private bank. For instance, the Indian Overseas Bank, I think Justice Masuf has given a judgment quite some time back, quashing the decision of uh, the Indian Overseas Bank. So similarly, I think that's uh, one thing that we have to get, uh, get over, that is that a writ lies only against the statutory or state body, because that is the concept that is coming in fundamental rights. That is to say, under Article 126 of the Constitution, you can ask for relief in respect of the violation of a fundamental right by executive or administrative action. There are no such restriction as far as it's are concerned. And the second uh, development, I think uh, I can mention as regards the petitioner. Now, the petitioner in a writ application those days, long ago, had to be a person who had a personal interest in what he's seeking. For instance, if he wants to quash by certiorari an order, he has, to, uh, he has to demonstrate to court how he is personally involved, how he is personally affected or prejudiced by that order, and that he wants it quashed for that reason. But that is not uh, any more good law today because there is some element of uh, sort of uh, public interest litigation as far as it's are concerned, especially several judgments of the uh, courts have, have, have recognized that anyone is entitled to have the law enforced. So you need not have a personal interest in the matter you are seeking to uh, bring, bring before the court. Another aspect of the personal aspect, uh, sorry, uh, another uh, practical aspect I want to mention is in regard to re respondents. Now, in a writ application for certiorari, right, at least two types of persons are needed as respondents. That is to say, the person who exercises power whose act is to be quashed. And secondly, all other persons will be affected by the quashing of that order. Then, another respect of respondents is now supposing you want to quash the decision of a statutory body such as a commission or a board consisting of several persons is it really necessary to make all of them respondents in say application for certiorari to quash now some time back justice masuf has delivered a judgment to the effect that in terms of uh, uh, the law a statutory body, which is a legal person, you can bring an application for certiorari only against the legal person. It's not necessary to make all the members of that legal person respondents to the application. And uh, of course, the very old concept of certiorari that it's available only to quash a judicial act or a quasi judicial act has long been abandoned. And any act which affects you or your interest, as Justice Nawaz said, any act, any act which affects your rights or your interests can be quashed. You don't have to worry about which judicial act or quasi judicial act. Uh, those are some of the developments in the recent past in respect of uh, certiorari and mandamus. 
uh, I think uh, without uh, taking more time, I can allow the other speakers, uh, Mr. Manohar Jayasinghe and the other speakers to have their say and we can maybe help the listeners by addressing them on their questions. Is it all right, Lakmini? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that uh, detailed analysis between the uh, distinction, if I may say, in 100 and, uh, Article 140 of the Constitution and in a fundamental rights application, where a fundamental rights application is limited to executive and administrative action, but in a writ application where a writ lies with regard to a first instance tribunal, court or even another institution to that extent, it's very wide uh, yeah. jurisdiction. So uh, to give another perspective to our topic today, we also have Mr. Manohar Jai Singh, uh, Senior State Counsel to address us how uh, these concepts should be in fact sometimes approached with caution. Over to you, Manohar. Thank you. Manohara, you're muted. Right. Thank you, Lakmini. In my estimation and analysis, I can identify at least five instances where this perceived expansion of administrative law has taken place. Um, so the first instance is where the courts would overcome a jurisdictional impediment that has been placed before it by parliament. So take, for example, Anis Minik versus the Foreign Compensation Commission, where Lord Reed used his ingenuity to circumvent ouster clauses by holding that ouster clauses do not protect errors of law which are tantamount to jurisdictional errors. So that's one illustration. The second example is where the courts have widened the circumstances to which judicial review will apply. Lord Reed, once again, dispensed with that traditional distinction and held that the principles of natural justice will apply not merely to judicial decision making, but also to administrative decision making. The third scenario is where the courts have broadened the types of entities that are liable for judicial review. So the famous case there is ex parte data fin. This was the judgment by John Donaldson, the master of the rule. It was followed by Justice Salim Masuk in the case that Dr. Kure mentioned, that's Harjani versus the Indian Overseas Bank. This is where the courts took the view that judicial review would extend even to non-statutory bodies. So the fourth example of how this perceived expansion of administrative law has taken place is where you broaden the scope of litigants that can apply for judicial review. So the case in point here is Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Pollution, famously called the Greenpeace case, this is where it was held by Otten, Justice Otten, that you need not be a person who is directly affected. It would be adequate if you can show a sufficient interest. And this presumably paved the way for what we call public interest litigation. The fifth illustration is where the court would adopt a more probing and a more searching analysis as opposed to the traditional abstentionist or deferential approach captured in Winsbury. This inevitably leads to what we call proportionality, 
And this test was adopted by Lord Stain in a famous case called Rex versus the Secretary of State upon the application of Daly, a case which was cited by Justice Obeseker with approval in writ application 66 of 2013. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as an officer of the Attorney General's Department, please don't be surprised if you don't find me particularly, particularly enamored by these claims, these sententious claims of how administrative law has been expanded. And just as what many people view as progression, we might view as regression and with good reason. And this is something which I would like to explain. But before I do Lakmini, I'd like to take a minute to uh, say that this is a very surreal experience for me to be part of a panel, which consists of such eminent personalities such as Justice Navas, who I've had the pleasure to appear before, and Dr. Kure, one of the most respected academics and practitioners in the field of law. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Salia Piris and Mr. Rajiv Amarasuriya, uh, not just for the invitation extended to me, but for the tremendous work they have been doing as president and secretary of the Bar Association. And I'd like to thank uh, Lakpini yourself and Anne and so many other people who've been working behind the scenes in order to organize this webinar. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in 1651, Thomas Hobbes authored this text called the Leviathan. So Leviathan is, I think, a biblical term which refers to a creature with enormous strength. This was obviously a metaphor used by Hobbes to capture the power of the state. So this begs the question, why should the state have so much power? The answer is bellum omnium contra omnis, because without a unified omnipotent sovereign, there would be a war of every man against every man. And as Hobbes explained, without an omnipotent sovereign, we would find that the life of man would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So this is why a political community confers this power upon the state. But if this power is untrammeled, this would lead to a depotism, and it would lead to oppression. And this is exactly what administrative law is about. Controlling the power of the state. So as I would understand it, the paradigm of administrative law is this. The state has enormous power. However, the power must be exercised in conformity with certain norms and rules which have been enacted by the political community that has consented to being governed. And in the event the state contravenes those norms, then the state will be censured by an independent agency which we call the judiciary. So I want to comment upon this further. So now let us go all the way from 1651 to 1982. There was an intelligence agency in England, which was not acknowledged by the government, but subsequently recognized, called the Government Communications Headquarters or the GCHQ. Now the Prime Minister of England, Baroness Thatcher, issued an order in council in the exercise of the prerogative powers of the Queen, prohibiting the members of the GCHQ from joining a trade union. 
This was challenged before the House of Lords, and this gave rise to a landmark judgment. Lord Diplock held, for one thing, that the prerogative powers of the Queen are susceptible to judicial review. But he also articulated the grounds of review, three traditional grounds of review, illegality, irrationality, and procedural impropriety, and hinted at a probable fourth ground of review called proportionality. I will deal with them very, very briefly. Illegality simply means a situation where the relevant state agency does not act in conformity with the law. So a typical illustration of this is where the state purports to exercise power when they have no legal authority to do so. So think of a situation where private property is acquired without a section 38 of the Land Acquisition Act where imported goods are forfeited without a section 47 of the customs ordinance, where income tax is imposed without a section two of the Inland Revenue Act. All of this would be illegal if that was the case for the reason that the state has acted without legal power. Now the second example or the second round of review adverted to by Lord Diplock is what is called irrationality. And in irrationality, Lord Diplock makes a cross reference to a famous case, which we all know, called the Associated Provincial Picture Houses case versus the Winsbury Corporation, and leading to what is called Winsbury unreasonableness. I will return to this question of irrationality in one minute. Moving over to the third round of judicial review is what is known as procedural impropriety. So what is meant by procedural impropriety is either a situation where there has been a failure to observe the principles of natural justice, such as the right to a fair hearing, or non-compliance with specific statutory procedures, which are preconditions to the exercise of power. That is generally what we call procedural impropriety. Now I want to go back to this question of irrationality. Irrationality was first expounded by Lord Green, master of the world, in the famous Winsbury case. Lord Green also refers to a previous judgment by Lord Justice Warrington in the case of Short versus Pool Corporation. This is that example of acting, engaging conduct that is manifestly absurd dismissing a school teacher because of her red hair. So generally the Wensbury test is used in two senses. One is a tripartite formulation. You pose the question, that is the court poses the question, did the decision maker consider or address its mind to the law? Did they bring within their contemplation all matters which are relevant? And did they exclude from their consideration all matters which are irrelevant? The second sense that Wensbury unreasonable is used is that decision adverted to by Lord, is that formulation adverted to by Lord Diplock that is a decision that is so morally outrageous, no sensible person could be thought to have arrived at it. So you would see that the formulation in Winsbury seems to indicate a policy of abstentionism, deference, where the courts are reluctant to interfere. Just one point of academic interest, which uh, probably outside the scope of this particular discussion, is that in a case called Edwards versus Bairstow, why can't Radcliffe seem to suggest that irrationality is nothing more than a concomitant or an extension of illegality? But today we know that irrationality is a stand-alone round of judicial review. Now, 
I recall reading in a textbook by Paul Craig, one of the eminent scholars of administrative law, that because of the high threshold advocated by Lord Green and Lord Diplock in Wensbury and the GCHQ case, there has been a reformulation of Wensbury to what is called high intensity Wensbury review. That is, you don't take that deferential approach, but you look at the matter in a more probing manner. Now, if this was as far as things would go, I probably wouldn't have any problem with it. But sometimes the courts take a step further. And this is where we tend to enter into that very, what I think is a controversial domain of proportionality. And please let me explain why I say that proportionality is something that must be viewed with circumspection. So proportionality presupposes that the state is pursuing a worthy objective. Once it is established that the state is pursuing a worthy objective, the court engages in a tripartite test. This is sometimes called the Oaks test in accordance with the judgment delivered by the Canadian Supreme Court called Rex versus Oates. So these are the three components of the test. The first question that you pose is, is the measure challenged by the citizen capable of achieving that objective? Does it have the effect of achieving that objective? The second component is, is that particular measure the least invasive or restrictive method of achieving that objective? Now, the third element in the tripartite test or the Oaks test is this. This is what Paul Craig calls proportionality stricter sensu. Whether the worthiness of that objective justifies the hardship caused to certain citizens. So this is the point of controversy, as I would say, because I feel, ladies and gentlemen, that this is the point where the courts descend from that elevated pedestal of an adjudicator and enter into the domain of policy making. And I opinion that the institutional structure of a court of law is not adept to deal with certain complexities that are better left to be handled by the executive. Now, I understand that this is a very controversial view, but I want to try to explain exactly why I am advocating this. So, as I explained before, law is all about controlling the power of the state. But we must be careful that the court should not on the guise of controlling the power of the state obliterate that power altogether. And the courts must be careful that in discharging their role of supervising the executive or the powers of the executive of arrogating those powers to themselves. So this is the continued controversy associated with proportionality. So the reason why that I say there is certain, whilst I do endorse some of the significant developments in administrative law, we must be careful as to how far we should go. Because if finally the powers of the state are reduced to naught, 
then as Hobbes used to say, we would be left in a state where our lives are solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So those are my comments for today, Lakmini, and uh, I'd like to hear some of the other perspectives from our participants. Thank you. Thank you, Manohara, for giving your insights with regard to specifically on the principle of uh, proportionality. Um, I would uh, like to ask, if at all, from Dr. Kure. Uh, Dr. Kure, you emphasized on the principle of standing. Um, yes. To that extent that even a person who doesn't have a direct interest or a personal interest need not come to court. But um, also, I, I think there are judgments where they have looked at and interpreted whether the person who's coming into court is a meddlesome busybody or an interloper. Where would we draw the line and identify whether this person who's coming to court is worthy of being and whether he has, in fact, has that? Well, I would say that uh, the law has developed uh, very much and uh, there's hardly any now meaning uh, in talking of an inter interloper, a person not having an interest coming for certiorari or your mandamus. Because you take cases like, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, there are so many cases, uh, recent cases, where the courts have been ready to grant rates and even fundamental rights. If there is uh, some sort of illegality, because now the trend is to say that, well, people are entitled to see that the law is enforced. The law is enforced. They need not have a personal interest in the matter because everybody has an interest in seeing that the law is enforced. So therefore, there is no need to show that you have any personal interest in the enforcement of a particular law. It's difficult to say how may you draw the line, but the line is sort of not mostly obliterated because now anyone can come to court and say, well, the law has to be enforced, say, pandemus. Or, I mean, if you're a citizen of the country, well, you have a very far, far-fetched interest in saying that the law must be enforced, but still the courts have recognized it. Anuhara, would you have anything to add on that line from your perspective? Yes, so this question, I think we have to accept the fact that public interest litigation is here to stay. Uh, there was a recent case which I argued uh, before I think Justice Arjuna Obesekara, where there was a dispute that essentially arose between two neighbors. And the one particular neighbor who was, I think, cited as a respondent was engaging in a construction and that was causing a nuisance. So rather than seeking an injunction against that particular neighbor, he filed a writ application against the municipal council and the urban development authority for their failure to take steps to arrest that particular construction, the allegation being there that the construction was in contravention of the development permit issued by the UDA. So I think this is, so when you're taking the traditional conservative approach, one would have been inclined to say the proper remedy would have been to seek an injunction in the district court against a person who is doing the illegal act. But I think this is a great example how the court tends to take a more uh, progressive approach if you look at it from the perspective of the petitioner and say, no, since the UDA has laid down regulations and if the UDA finds a particular, if they put on notice that a particular person is violating those regulations, the failure of the UDA to take steps according to law will warrant judicial intervention. So that's one example I can think of where the courts tend to take this more liberal and expansive approach. Thank you, Manohara. 
Um, now that uh, the main um, sessions by speakers are over, I invite all of you all to uh, come up with your questions. If there are any direct questions to be answered by uh, Dr. Sunil Kure and Mr. Manohara Jayasimha. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Kure, sir, I would like to ask you also with regard to um, necessary parties in an application. Um, sometimes there might be, uh, if you are challenging some promotion round, there will be so many uh, people who have received promotions where petition that uh, in violation of the service minute or some other ground. So how do you practically handle a situation where you need to make all of the parties then issuing notice uh, from the apart from the legal side of it and also from practical perspective, I have seen in situations where in any fundamental rights applications, parties get permission to, I think, publish paper notice. Uh, in a written application, uh, how can we approach that issue? Now, uh, you referred to, say, promotions. The promotions uh, will hardly attract the jurisdiction because it's a matter of contract between the employee and the employer. And uh, maybe that uh, in such cases, uh, if you are promoted or if, if, if you say that the wrong person has been promoted, several persons have been promoted wrongly, they, may, they must all be made parties. But whether you can come for a writ regarding your failure or rather your then you've been deprived of a promotion, I doubt very much. But of course, there can be cases where there are hundreds of people who should be made respondents in the sense that, well, now I think there was that Colombo uh, North Medical Council case some time back. Several parties had to be made respondents. And I think the case failed mainly on that basis that all the people who were going to be affected by the writ were not made parties to the application. And uh, of course, uh, as you said, uh, a paper notice will be a one, one possibility. Uh, that's the only possibility I can think of if there are hundreds of persons who have made respondents in a reality application, like an FR application. Mr. Jaising, what do you say to that? Yeah, okay. So this question of uh, necessary parties, to be quite frank, I'm not a big fan of raising that type of objection for the reason that it makes the whole process of instituting a writ application very cumbersome. So you can't, it's not fair, I think, for the state to, to throw sort of these insurmountable hurdles towards petitioners that come to court, because I think there must be some sense of chivalry and fair play in the adversarial process. I would probably think that there are three occasions where the state would not merely be justified, but would be required to raise this objection on necessary parties. One situation is where a person, where a potential outcome in a writ application would have a definitive effect on another person. So if you're seeking a job or a promotion or some position, which would come at the expense of another person, then I think that person becomes a necessary party. The second scenario where I think necessary parties would constitute a valid objection is where even the, that particular party may not be really affected as such. The court is unable to formulate a very complete picture of the dispute without hearing the version of that particular party. But this would be the second instance. The third instance is sort of connected to the second one. This is where sometimes it happens where petitioners actively suppress certain parties from uh, uh, refrain from citing them as respondents in order to mislead the court. And that would probably be the most pertinent case where the necessary party objection would be invoked. But here's something interesting, uh, Dr. Kore, Lakmini, and all of our uh, uh, attendees and participants. There was a recent judgment by Justice Lafar. Um, in that particular case, Justice Lafar 
uh, went to the just to explain the facts of that case very briefly. I think this is another another construction related case where a group of neighbors challenged the construction of a condominium property, and the objection was raised that if you are challenging the construction of an apartment complex, then every person who has invested in that particular apartment complex by even giving an advance, that person would be a necessary party. Justice Lafar upheld that objection. Interestingly, I that was probably, you know, even looking at it from the perspective of the state, I might have not have gone so far as to raise that objection because I think then you're coming to a situation that the, it, an indeterminate group of people become necessary parties. But I think this is a great indication as to show how the courts take a very, very stringent view on necessary parties. So. Thank you, Manohara, for that uh, outline. Thank you, Dr. Kure, uh, for that outline with regard to uh, the respondents, the necessary parties in a writ application. Um, also, uh, Dr. Kure, uh, yeah. Mr. Kaisinger, I would, I would like to also uh, uh, get your input, your views, uh, with regard to the fact that uh, we uh, substantive review, we had an outline from Justice Navas with regard to procedural impropriety or uh, uh, what would your views be that uh, being also a ground for judicial review? in that sense. Well, basically it will be procedural impropriety would be failure of natural justice as Justice uh, Nava said. And apart from that, supposing certain procedures had to be followed prior to the exercise of power, and the statute requires certain procedures to be followed. And if those procedures are not followed, then that again will be a case of statutory impropriety, attracting a writ application. I think those are the basically two instances in which procedural impropriety will be a ground for judicial review. Uh, so in, in, in such instance, yeah, <clears throat> is it right to say that uh, state could thereafter come to court when a question of procedural impropriety is raised? and uh, concede that situation and say that, okay, we are going to go back and give you a hearing. Will that cure the situation after, afterwards? Yes. That will certainly cure, cure the situation. So the court can allow that to be done. Maybe the court can formally question the order that had been already made because it's tainted by procedural irregularity. And the court can let the parties go back and inquire to be held so that there will no more be a procedural impropriety. It can be done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Manohara, is there anything you would like to add on that? I think that's a very pertinent question, Lakmini, this distinction between process rights and substantive rights. So if we envisage a situation where, for example, uh, uh, the Minister of Lands wants to acquire my property, so before he does that, he affords me an opportunity under section four, this is assuming that this is not an urgent acquisition and permits me to prefer my objections. And then if he can show that he addressed his mind to all of my objections, and if he then concluded that he needed, that, he, that he's anyway going to proceed with the acquisition, then I think the ball falls back on the court of the petitioner. And now all of a sudden his task is so much more difficult because if the acquisition is intended for what is ostensibly a public purpose, if he has given me a fair hearing, then I think the task of the petitioner would be very difficult unless he can show that the minister, though perceptively acting to further a public purpose, is guided by some kind of improper 
motive or is in actual fact seeking to further some collateral purpose. So for example, Lakuni, let's say there is a particular community that needs a hospital. And let's say my, that my property is acquired for the construction of a hospital. And I'm given an opportunity to explain why my land should not be acquired. The minister considers my objection and says, no, it is your land that has to be acquired. Then if it will be shown that, hold on, this particular minister or public official is constructing a hospital, which is indisputably a public purpose, but he's planning to give the contract for the construction of the hospital to some political benefactor, that would be a case of improper motive. And that would suffice, I think, to quash the acquisition, even though it is ostensibly and perceptibly fair. Thank you, Manohare. Uh, on that point, uh, I don't think we have received any more questions. Um, on that note, I think we uh, can conclude uh, this webinar today. Uh, thank you so much, um, Justice Namaz, although he's not here right now, for taking time from his busy schedule to join with us. For this webinar today, Dr. Kure and also um, Jaya Singha for joining this webinar. This, I believe, is the 170th uh, webinar and marks the last webinar for this term. Um, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And uh, uh, over to you, Tanuja. Thank you, Lakmini. Thank you, Ms. Vasubhidana. On behalf of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and the Seminars Committee, I would like to thank His Lordship, Justice A.H.M.D. Nawaz, Dr. Sunil Kure, Mr. Manohar Jai Singer, and Mrs. Lakmini Vasubhidana for this very informative and valuable session on the topic, Expanding Frontiers of Administrative Law. I would also like to thank all of you who joined us through Zoom and YouTube. Thank you, everyone. As I have already mentioned, this is the final webinar of this English webinar series organized by the BAS Seminars Committee. But you can watch every webinar organized thus far by visiting the BASL YouTube channel. Stay safe.